Hello and welcome to the invited talk uh, of today. It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend uh, Jan Rabai, professor in the graduate school and uh, professor emeritus in uh, the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Jan and I uh, go back a long way. Uh, even before uh, meeting in person, we're both working on uh, computer AD design. I was on SPICE and Jan figured out that SPICE could not do everything, so he worked on a simulator called Diana, which was holding switch capacitor circuits. Uh, you know, a, a little derivative of real analog circuits. And uh, then uh, we met later in Berkeley, uh, where uh, Jan uh, covered many subjects starting from digital circuits, from his uh, famous book on uh, digital integrated circuits, and uh, to his uh, most recent uh, interests uh, in uh, controlling the brain. Okay. So yeah. it's the uh, machine uh, brain interface that uh, he's going to tell us a little bit uh, about it today. Last but not least, uh, I'd like to say that uh, we can consider uh, Jan is uh, a distinguished um, associate member of the Bordeaux community as he is a winemaker, a very successful winemaker covering a number of things, not only, you know, your things here, Bordeaux, uh, Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, and these things, but also Sangiovese, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet. Jan, please. Thank you, Andre. Uh, real pleasure to be here. It's my first live talk since uh, January 2020. So I hope I still haven't uh, lost uh, the skills to do so. Well, indeed. So what I'm going to talk about today is something that I have been mulling about since the pandemic. Actually, it gave me some time for reflection. And so this talk today might be a little bit more philosophical. Um, and uh, you will see where I've been leading. But it's all about the case for distributed intelligence, intelligence everywhere, and how can we make it happen, right? So we all know that if you're looking forward in the design of the next generation integrated circuits, energy will be the most important part. And that's true for every aspect of design. If you go, <clears throat> Sorry, if you go all the way, let me just those. If you go all the way from the cloud to the mobile to the edge, in each of those cases, what we will be able to do will be governed by energy. Okay. And I'm not going to talk about the cloud today. I'm not going to talk about mobile. I'm going to focus on what I call the edge or the extreme edge and how we can actually forward and basically become a lot more effective from an energetic perspective. Now you're all familiar with IoT. And again, IoT itself is basically now been around for about 10, 15 years, but it's morphing. It's morphing again in something which I now call the internet of actions. It is not anymore about sensors in the environment, gathering information, and transmit it to the cloud so you can do some data analysis on it. It is about feedback systems where that information is then used to perform some actions in the environment. And this picture shows a lot of possibilities. It goes from drones, basically auto automatic vehicles or autonomous vehicles. We talk about machine or manufacturing optimization, robots, as well as basically robot-human interaction and ultimately interaction with humans themselves. And all of those are about closed loop action, sensing, interpretation, action. Um, I have one more extreme case that I've been kind of been very interested in. Before going though, there though, so if you look at any one of those systems, you see that some properties are really crucial. If you have from sensing to action, latency is really important. In most cases, you want to have very rapid response. But there's a whole bunch of other things that really play an important role. Robustness is really crucial. Security, privacy, 
uh, transparency is becoming more and more critical as well and gets a lot of attention, ethics and so on. But to me, in order to have those systems to work effectively, we need to think about intelligence. They have to be able to make intelligent decisions based on the information they're getting in. And as I already said, energy efficiency. Now, one extreme case where this is, uh, all of this is true for sure, is around our human body. More and more, we're starting to put all kinds of sensors on our body, measuring how we are performing, what we're doing. We're all carrying watches these days that measure our heart rate and all other things, how many steps we do every second and all those kind of things. But it's gonna extend a lot more. It's gonna be about sensing all kinds of biophysical parameters, sensing what is happening in the world around us, taking that information, interpreting it, and ultimately translating it again into action which could be exoskeletons, brain-machine interfaces, or better vision, or better hearing. All of those type of things. I call that the human internet. A network of sensors, actuators, and intelligence built around and being symbiotic with our biological body. And again, we have the same constraints when you build those things, but even more extreme. So latency, privacy, security, uh, transparency, um, one extra factor becomes more important here is form factor. If I put something inside my body or on my body, I want to make it sh make sure it is small, it is conform, it is flexible, something that you forget that it's basically there. In a lot of cases, it has to be extremely tiny. So some big challenges here. Trying to address all of those type of things requires progress. Lots of progress. So... That's really what we're talking about. This is the general picture of the system we're trying to build. We basically we call them decisioning systems, where you get sensors, you extract information from the sensors, you have intelligence that do pre-processing, then I start doing interpretation and ultimately performs motor fraction, translate into action, and basically drive some actuators. And as I said, there are many, many, many problems in each aspect of such a system. So, what does it take to make it happen? So, actually, late 2019, uh, the SRC, the Semiconductor Research Corporation in the US, together with SIA, the Semiconductor Industry Association, went on this effort to basically talk to a number of academics and so on and so forth to figure out what are the big challenges and the big changes to come in the next 10 years. It's a beautiful document that I would recommend that you read you can find it on the SRC website. It's called the Decadal Plan, um, and it goes to about the year 2030. And it identifies some seismic shifts that are going to happen in design. And here's the list of them. Not going to go into the detail. They're actually not real surprises. It is about fundamental breakthroughs in analog hardware. We need to interact with all that sensing and extract information from that. That requires us to rethink analog. Very nice in line with this particular workshop here. Memory. The growth of memory demands will all strip the capabilities that we have today. So we have to think about novel storage situation. Number three is about communication. We create more data than we can communicate. The communication is expensive. So what can we do to get around that? Number four, security, is absolutely essential and privacy. They're, as I already mentioned, they're an essential component. And then finally, number five is energy efficiency. Now, if you think about my internet of action or my human internet, all of these things matter. All of those things have to, we have to find solutions in each of those particular fronts. And again, I would recommend you look at this document. There's a couple of presentations there as well. It's very insightful in some of the number perspective. So how to address this? There's many answers, right? Yesterday we heard that maybe quantum computing might be an answer to basically address some of those issues. There might be other approaches, uh, organic computing, all those kind of things might help us to rethink the way we move forward. But my part, as um, Andre was saying over the last 15 years, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about 
interacting with the brain, brain machine interfaces. And while doing so, I talked to a lot of neuroscientists, computational neuroscientists, and started to learn a little bit about how our brain operates. And the brain is an amazing machine. It does amazing things from every aspect of sensory information, interpretation of that, and translating it to action, all for 20 watts, uh, which is incredible. So we may be getting some inspiration from nature to help us to move forward in each of those different aspects. So this is what I'm going to be focusing on this talk today, getting some inspiration from the brain to help us to address some of those problems that I just delineated. Now, the interesting part is that this uh, kind of cross fertilization between neuroscience and engineering is already happening. If you look at this, if we're building this kind of humanoid robots, what you start to do is replicate the basically system that we are having in our humans. There's basically a, a sensory system in there, there's a communication system, there's computing, and ultimately action. So that's one side. We're basically replicating using electronics what's happening in the biological world. The other part of what we're doing is augmenting our organic body uh, by basically a very, very simple example here, uh, AR, VR as an example of extension. But you can think about so many other things. Again, we're wearing our phone. Our phone is now becoming an extension of our body. Watches are. Um, think about hearing aids. Uh, the next generation hearing aids are going to be augmentations of our organic system using electronics. So electronics and organics are starting to get integrated. So this is already happening, and I think we'll see a lot more of that going forward. Now, in order to understand it, it's probably worthwhile to look a little bit at how our neural system works, how basically our neural environment works. And we can see that if you look at the whole neural system, you see that it consists of a number of feedback loops. There are actually two important feedback loops. One of them is called the inner feedback. The other one is called the outer loop. The inner loop basically is just there to make sure that your body keeps running. It senses a bunch of biometric parameters. Are you hungry? Are you uh, tired? All those kind of things are being measured. Is your temperature right? And then these are little patterns that are being measured. That are then forwarded from the peripheral to the central neural system and where those small patterns, information of various sensors, get combined into what we call big patterns larger picture of what is going on. And then you basically compare this, this getting compared to what you know already, what you have learned over the past. So this comparison is basically compared to stored patterns, and out of this we can predict what we should do and translate this again into action and basic actuation. So this loop is very important. That basically makes us run correctly on 24 hours or basically continuously. Now, it's not sufficient. You also have to have a sense of the world around you, how I behave and walk in the world around me. So I have five or seven senses, depending on how we discuss it, that observe the world around us. We see, we hear, we smell, we touch, all those type of things. And again, very similarly, those small patterns get combined into bigger patterns and ultimately get compared to what we know and translated into actions. So that's the type of system we're trying to build. Is basically something that has multiple layers of abstraction built on top of each other and basically try to you know, basically do this in a reliable way. So summary of that is close-up feedback systems nested at different layers of abstraction. So we go from small patterns, little sensors that basically are very raw information, and then basically we have this inner and outer loop. And again, energy is the most important thing. I like this slide a lot. It turns out, they say, if you waste the, the amount of energy that your brain consumes is directly proportional to the number of neurons you have. The more neurons you operate, the more you have to eat, the more sugar you have to take in. So you say, well, if I have a bigger brain, things will be very nice, but you would have to eat a lot more. So that's a challenge, an energy challenge that emerges. Now, what I'm going to do now is the rest of this talk. I'm going to actually go to one interesting book that, again, that you should read. It's um, 
Um, okay, one second before I go there. I just want to show an example of the small to large pattern uh, that I just explained before. This is in the vision system. If you look at the vision system, it's basically a set of layers of processing. At the bottom level, you have the retina, and the retina basically gets is an imager. Right? An imager which has about 8,000 pixels or something like that, pretty precise. And the first thing you do in the retina itself is basically extract certain patterns, some information, contrast, uh, basically intensity, and so on and so forth. So you get a bunch of small patterns. And then you go by layer by layer, those patterns get combined into bigger pictures that basically get a more global or more abstract perspective. This is the way your retina operates. This is the way some of the more advanced or some of the neural networks that we're basically having today are operating exactly the same way. These are basically convolutional neural nets uh, that basically layered on top of each other. So very similar to what our body basically does, small patterns to large patterns. Okay, so as I said, that I want to refer you to one book that's written by uh, Peter Sterling and Simon Laughlin. It's called The Principles of Neural Design. It's one of those neuroscience books that's written by an, almost like an engineer. Most of those other books are very, very uh, hard to handle, but this one really looks at the brain from an engineering perspective and comes up with some design principles of how you build neural systems. And here's a list of them. I, there's basically five principles, and I added two of myself because I thought it was a bit interesting. I thought it was missing certain components. So here are some of those things from that particular book. Is, uh, number one is computed chemistry whenever you can. Now, that's a very strange one, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Number two, send only information that is needed and send it as slowly as possible. Now think about our 6G networks, where we try to transmit as fast as possible. It's kind of the opposite perspective. You want to be energy efficiency, you don't want to go too fast. Store new information at the place where it's processed and from whence it's going to be recalled. Again, this starts ringing a bell because actually some of our designs are going in that direction. Don't send everything to the cloud. <coughs> Number four is something is called Complicate. Complicate, actually, this is the term that neuroscientists use. I like to use the word uh, customize. If you know a certain function, don't try to make it in a generic term. Basically, use that knowledge and make it more efficient. And then there's a two more, as I said, that I had myself, self-calibrate and heal. Really important. And then finally, play the number game or randomize. Use random approaches to basically get efficiency. So now that's true for neurons and neural networks. The question is, can we map that to basically uh, physical networks as we are basically playing around with it? The basically the physical plant, silicon or whatever it is, do those things transform from the organic domain to the physical domain? So let's go to a couple of those things. The first one is computed chemistry. You understand how the neural network work basically, it, it, it's basically an electrochemical system. It uses electrical signals to basically go between neurons, but the interaction between different neurons is, is basically a chemical process, where we have ion channels that are being opened and we have uh, potassium and sodium moving back and forth. Turns out to be extremely efficient. If you think about energy efficiency in design, there's one number that we all know. It is KTLN2. Uh, it's shown that is the absolute minimum I can do a digital switch uh, basically implementing. KTLN2 is about 10 to the minus 21 joule. Now you think about CMOS of today and a digital gate that we're operating is about five to six orders of magnitude away from this KTLN2. So the question is, if you want to become more efficient in computing, how can we do that? Well, we should try to find means to get close to that KTLN2. Right? And here's kind of a rank ordering. It turns out that chemical computing, as I said, gets very close to it. Maybe about a factor 10 to 100, which is the closest that I know I can get to that minimum number. And then it goes and says, well, maybe you should do analog because our brain basically is an analog computer. It's not a digital, it's discrete occasionally, but it doesn't use ones and zeros. 
So digital computing actually turns to be expensive. Every operation I do in NAND gate, the NOR gate, something like that, is far more expensive than doing an operation in the analog domain. So rethinking analog computing is an interesting approach to at least get better and closer to our chemical type of design. So that's kind of one of the key messages here. And spiking, or basically time-driven networking, might be somewhere as well. And a lot of people are playing around with that with spiking neural nets. So here's an example of how efficient chemistry can be. As I said, an, a synapse, the connection between neurons, is basically electrochemical chemical operation. And what you do is basically, anytime there's something happening, you basically have some ions coming in, and you open an iron channel that gets potassium or sodium moving into the neural cell. Now, it turns out that opening a single iron channel takes about 75 kT. That's the lowest digital operation that I know of. Open and close, that's a switch, right? And I can do this for 75 kT, which is, again, orders and orders of magnitude better than what you would get with a digital computer today. Uh, so, obviously, once you open that channel, then I can basically create current and then I can have a lot more information flowing through it. Now, obviously, doing this on a chip might be hard. But maybe we can come close. We might be able to do some things that get closer to it. I already mentioned analog computing. Analog computing, you've probably all seen this chart that came from a number of people over the time. I, uh, Sharp Peshkar in this book had a picture of it. Boris Merman has been showing various versions. But it shows that if you don't need a lot of resolution, if you don't need a lot of accuracy, actually, if, or in other words, if your SNR is low, analog is more energy efficient than digital. It's simple. You can do very complex operations like multiplication, division, powers, exponentials. You can all those things with one single transistor. While a digital gate, a NAND gate, takes you about four to six transistors to just do anything. So analog computing is very attractive if I can live with low accuracy. And it turns out low accuracy very often is just what you need in a lot of those type of applications. And again, people have figured that out. There is now a lot of work going on in analog compute for neural nets, where you do a matrix multiply in the analog domain. Just one example here, this is from the group of Boris Merman in Stanford a couple of years ago, showing basically an analog multiplier basically in uh, implemented and at a power cost of about 900 microwatts as a core element of a digital neural network. This actually also shows a second principle. As I already mentioned, store new data where it's processed. Don't basically, current computers do nothing else than you have a very fast data path and you shuffle data back and forth to the memory. Now, in-memory compute is really important. Store the data and do the computation intermingled with the data, exactly like the brain does. The brain doesn't have memory regions. Actually, memory is everywhere. It's in our synapses. That's where all the information is being stored. And it's very close to your computation. So again, this does the same thing, because now that DAC array, basically, that we showed there is also a memory array, stores element. And there's many other examples of this. This was a, a project that, uh, or a chip that was published by uh, people from IBM in Zurich. It showed, again, in-memory compute, analog compute in memory, but also it added one more thing. It basically used non-volatile capability, uh, things like PC RAM or RAM. And think about it, PC RAM or RAM or all these resistive memory strategies are basically chemical processes. What I'm doing is I'm changing the material by creating some ion channels or something like that. Hey, that's getting very close to what our synapses are starting to do. So non-volatility, basically storing information in a permanent way by changing the material is an interesting step in that direction. So interesting type of things, but in or near memory compute is clearly what our brain does and what we should try to go after. Transmit only what is needed and transmit it as slowly as possible. Again, nature has many examples of this. Consider your eye. 
Again, I talk about the IP4. It's a very beautiful, uh, a really good imager, but we don't transmit raw video data to our brain. The first thing you do is go to a couple of layers of, of, of neurons, uh, the rod cells and so on and so forth, and what they do is do feature extraction. But as a net result, it does a gigantic compression on the amount of information that's being sent to the visual cortex. So we're getting an input of about 8.75 megabits per second per eye, basically. And through different steps, first of all, in the retina, then transmitting it to the optical nerve, you arrive at the cortex. Actually, in the end, per image, you probably have about eight bits that you're basically going to be using. It's very limited. Is a person move? There's certain action that you see happening, and so on and so forth. So a dramatic reduction by basically performing computation in the sensors. And again, we start to do those type of things. Here's an example of some of those cameras, which I really like, these event cameras. Cameras that don't transmit video or complete images, but only changes in pixels. And by doing so, it becomes basically asynchronous, but also minimizes the amount of energy I have to use to transmit the information. And you actually can do beautiful things with this. Actually, most kind of, uh, a lot of the radar top things now starting to go to this event driven data. Many other examples. Here, there's a chip that we designed a bunch of years ago for brain machine interfaces. Uh, basically, con uh, collects about 64 channels of information, of pure neural information, neurons firing, non firing, things like that, noise. If you transmit all that stuff out, you basically would need about 14 megabits per second. But most of it is noise, it's meaningless, you don't really need it. What you need is how often does the neuron fire. And if you extract that on the chip using a digital processor or whatever, we can go down all the way down to 10 kilobits per second. So we save a lot of the power of our communication. And again, communication is very expensive. So this is kind of the picture that emerges. We really need to think about this in sensor, in memory compute. Similar to what our vision system does, similar to what our olfactory system does. Lots of sensors, lots of information, very often redundant information. We first basically compress it in the sensor itself, reduce it to a number of basic elements, transmit it to our processor, which then does Again, expansion, massive expansion in high dimensional representations, does extraction, interpretation, and so on and so forth. So in sensor computation, this latter one is more in memory computation. So this combination of the two can lead to some very interesting perspectives. And again, we start to build hardware that looks like that. Basically the capability of now combining logic, analog, sensing, memory, all of this in integrated form factors is really crucial. That's going to give us the form factors we need to basically have these things wearable, implantable, and so on and so forth. All right, two more concepts. One of them you already know, complicate. Um, it was, I think, in the late 2000s, 2009 and 10, that people started realizing that general purpose processors were a total waste. The uh, power of basically, if you compare a particular function implemented in an ASIC versus something which is a general purpose processor, is three orders of magnitude difference. If you know a function, trying to map this on a general purpose processor is going to cost you a lot of energy. And that's even more true today. If I think about some of those systems we're building for data acquisition, uh, be, it, be it vision, be it motion, be it whatever it is, if I can extract the data and interpret it on the spot, I can do this uh, using a dedicated processor, I can make this very effective. So this is an example of a chip that was designed by one of my colleagues, Ricky Muller's group, which basically is a seizure detection unit. It basically takes information from a set of, of electrodes on your brain, and it helps you to do seizure detection. Very simple algorithm that basically is focused exactly doing this, it's a classifier. It consumes about 0.1 millimeter square. It's nothing from an area perspective and about 1.5 microwatt. If you would have a general purpose process, this would be a lot more expensive. So dedicate, dedicate, dedicate when you can is gonna help you to do. And again, 
This is something that our brain does as well. Our brain does look like a whole bunch of identical neurons. Every region has specialized connections and features. Then um, another one I think is important is self-calibration. Um, if you start doing analog design, you say, well, you know, we have variability, we have all these kind of things. How do you make a thing like this reliable? And again, our system, our, um, our neural system has come up with some beautiful answers to that. It, it uses feedback. It takes the data in and then it basically adjusts the system to basically get the right response. Just like we do in some adaptive circuitry today as well. But here's where it's a very simple example. Uh, if you look at your eye, the center of your eye is where you have most of the neurons, the, the, the basically the imagers. The more you go to the edge, you have less resolution. So if you want to look at something and you want to get high resolution, you basically adjust and you move your eye in such a way that what you want to observe is in the center of your eye in what's called the favea. Now, the way this is done is very clever. It's not something that you direct completely. It's not something that comes from higher end and say, look that way. No, the eye, is, if you look at it, basically you have the, the optical nerve takes the data from the, it's coupled into an area that actually observes some of that information and directly basically gives feedback to the motor function that closes your eye and automatically starts moving your eye in the right direction in such a way that you have high resolution. It's a very beautiful adaptive system in such a way that you get at most times the highest resolution information. We can do the same thing in analog. And, and, and this again is something we're starting to do as well already. You say, well, okay, I have some sensor, I have made some signal conditioning and ultimately conversion. But rather to make this thing work well, rather than making this open loop, when you say you have a digital circuitry, you observe some of the fish and then you feed it back and fine tune the various elements up front, you adapt the structures up front. So it's a very similar picture that we start doing in some of what we call digitally assisted mixed signal type of design. It's adaptation, and potentially if something goes wrong, we might even do healing. Now finally, the one I like the most is use randomness. Randomness is good uh, for a number of features, uh, for a number of reasons. If you look at a synapse, any synapse of your brain, and you look at the signals, I show a number of them here, they look like noise. And they are darn close to noise. They actually will operate at about 10, 50 microvolt approximately. Very small signal, a lot of noise level. In itself, if you take one synapse, it wouldn't have a lot of information. But every neuron has maybe 100, 1,000, 10,000 inputs. And what happens is, as a result of that, you get some population encoding. The information emerges by the fact that it's repeated many, many, many times. So play the random game. And as a result of this, SNR basically improves with the number of channels I basically have. A very simple trick that's used over and over and over in our human body. Here's another example that we see happening often. Your, your nose. If you think about a dog, the dog has about 100 million sensors in the nose. They're incredible number of sensors. We have about a factor, I think, three or four orders less than that. Those sensors are really lousy. These are not good sensors. Basically, they measure a presence of a molecule, they bind to a molecule and say, okay, this is present or not. But each of those sensors might recognize a multiple uh, molecules. They might not be sticking to one, but they actually have a bunch of choices. And they're all different. So, and those basically are not very selective. But the fact that we have so many, we have population encoding, and out of that noisy picture emerges something which is very accurate. So we can get really good, high quality smell, amazing smell, like you take a Bordeaux wine and you can figure out it's from saint emilion or saint Um It's amazing, right? You can do that and with those kind of lousy sensors out there. And the fact is, we have many, many, many of them. So dealing with low SNR as a result. So we can do the same thing. This is a project I had with I have, I've been running with my students, which really is uh, EMG detection for basically prosthetics and gesture recognition. So rather than having a few sensors that measure EMG signals on your arm, muscle signals, you put a complete array. 
uh, we can make arrays that are quite dense. We, it's flexible. We print those things on polymers. So in this case, we have 64 electrodes. And you get single arrays like this. It's not one single electrode that basically will tell you what is happening. But it's the pattern that emerges that we can then use to classify to basically perform gestures and so on and so forth. So again, we're playing the number game in this particular situation. So these are just some thoughts. Thoughts are basically things we learn from looking at nature. Some of them might apply, some of them might not. Because silicon is not organic. They're different. And you have to understand that difference. But at the same time, it is worth to get that inspiration. So in summary, think from sensing to actuation, think about a couple of things. A, make it simple. I, make, frugal is important. Make it a simple and energy frugal. Um, use the right representations. Digital is expensive. So don't think otherwise, oh, we should have a need to deconvert as fast as possible and do it digital. No, think about what is the right representation. Sometimes spikes are the right representation. Sometimes a simple analog signal or an array of analog signals is the right thing. Avoid communication as much as you can. And that's true both in our neural system as well as on chips. Communicating is really expensive. So if you can do it local, if you can do processing next to the source, that's cool. And uh, sensing, mixed signal, computing, memory, they're all getting intertwined. It's not the thing with the idea of the past anymore where you have memory block and a processing block and things like that. We really are starting to mix those things up. And then basically the last one I think is very important, dynamically adjust. And you might be working with lousy, but not perfect, not very nice signals, very small signals, but use adaptation to get the best results. And finally, learn. Adjust, learn over time. Those are kind of the key messages that we have been trying to use on a set of design. Now, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. I just want to point out that I've actually been over, again, as pandemic was happening over the last year or so, I've had a quite a bit of time to sit back. So I'm writing this very long paper. Um, it's about 100 pages when it's all done. Um, it should come out early next year. It's called Our Brains and Computers. And it's really trying to put the two next to each other and compare them number-wise at multiple level of hierarchy and potentially show out some solutions of where we might go in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Do we have questions for Jan? Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much for this presentation. Very interesting. I just wonder if what you think that so far we think that artificial intelligence will be rather human centered the way we want to connect with it. Like we got a brain, we got a neuron, we got a sense of that. Do you think that uh, another part of biology could be also interesting, like for plants, where we don't have any brain, but we still have uh, synaprasts in there, that maybe is processed in a completely different way, they can be very efficient in the way we do the same. Now, that's, that's a very good question. The question is, uh, is there other inspiration to be found in nature that we could use? And um, the answer is absolutely yes. Obviously, there's a whole set of scales, right? There's some very primitive animals, right? The little worms and things like that, that have very simple networks that we can learn from already. They have some basic principles and that might be very applicable to certain areas. Now, you go to plants, the same thing happens, right? There's some processes going on there in terms of energy harvesting, energy translation, and, and so on and so forth. And, and plants somewhere, they have sensors too. Right? They have sensors towards the environment and basically. So some of those concepts definitely would apply as well. So there's another area I, I basically talk here, the whole area of organic computing is still something that is very interesting as well. It's chemical processing. Um, so there was a whole field of synthetic biology that basically tried to build computing engines from basically uh, organic type of structures. Uh, hasn't gone very far for the last 10 years, but my prediction is that you will see a lot of things happening in that domain in the next decade or so. And there's only one good reason for it. It's called CRISPR. 
CRISPR is this genetic manipulation capabilities that we built that allows us now to take uh, pieces of DNA and start messing around with them and do all kinds of interesting things to actually build computers potentially. Now, those computers are not gonna run at gigahertz. They're gonna run at operations per hour or something like that, right? But uh, uh, there's this whole continuum, I think, that you will see in terms of, and it really depends on what you expect, right? How fast do you wanna get a response? What are the type of things you're observing? Say if I'm observing the environment around me, it doesn't change very quickly. Uh, so things that operate at the rates of, well, one sample per hour might be just fine. So yes, absolutely, this is a very good ob observation. Okay. Other questions? Okay, I'll ask a uh, provocative Maybe question. I have one. Yeah, please. Yeah. So concerning, uh, uh, for instance, in the car, we, we have uh, radars now, leaders and so on. And uh, the trend is to transmit uh, the globality of the signal to the computer and say that the computer will have all the signals and will do the processing and will do the, the mm -hmm. reaction. Uh, but this, this is normally to reduce the latency mm -hmm. of the reaction uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the car. But if we consider a new approach, uh, a radar, an image coming from a radar doesn't change a lot between uh, one in 100 milliseconds, for instance. Mm -hmm. That means that uh, I have just to, to send to the computer mm -hmm. the change mm -hmm. and reduce the communication. Right. Right. So again, so it is this whole kind of uh, uh, balance between centralization versus distribution, right? And right now, I think we are extremely centralized oriented, right? Uh, people think about the autonomous cars, well, we should basically send all the information out, and, and a lot of the other, everything we do on the internet, basically, we do, we speak to our computer, that stuff is going to somewhere, I don't know where, on a data center that basically will do some recognition on it, and then come back with some work. Think about the cost of just shipping that data back and forth. Energy-wise, is very high. So we really need to think about what should I do locally? It's only when you need to share information that it becomes useful actually to basically go central. Or if the centralized thing is very smart, right? For instance, I, I, if I measure something, I get a particular heartbeat measurement, and there's something abnormal, something I that haven't observed before then it obviously makes sense to go to that vast database out there that says, hey, what, the hell, what, does, what could this be? Right? But it's only when you see abnormal behavior that you would go back to the, to the more centralized operation. So I'm a very strong advocate of distributed intelligence. And distributed intelligence is not about the fact that every node should have some intelligence, but also the nodes at the edge should talk to each other and work together, like swarms, like, you know, if you think of a flock of birds, they locally synchronize with each other, they exchange information locally. They have basically, and, and not everybody sees the same thing, they share information from point to point. So distributed intelligence on the edge is another interesting thing I think may happen. But, but again, it's a balance. There are certain things that are definitely worthwhile to put at the edge or the, the cloud itself. So it's, and again, but it shouldn't be, baked into the system. Maybe we can think something that's adaptive depending up on circumstances, where you are, how much connectivity you have, all those type of things impact what you build. I fully agree with you, but it's not the business model of uh, big companies such as Amazon, uh, Google, and so on. That's why I'm an Same academic. Thank to concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. It, 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 now, obviously, the, uh, so Google, Goal of life of Google is to let, collect information. That's the that's their only thing they do. They they, they are a data gold mine, and that's what they're trying to do. They try to grab as much information from you as they can, and ultimately sell that for a variety of purposes. Ads, but also think about think about Verily, for instance. Verily is the medical arm of Google. Uh, they basically do 
you talk to those people, they said they build very nice gadgets. But in the end, they told me, they said, we don't really care about the gadgets. We only built the gadgets to get information, data. What really buys us is medical data. And we go, if we can buy the device from somebody else, we'll do so. If it doesn't exist, we'll build it. But ultimately, we want the information. And the same thing is true with Apple, by the way. They are also, you know, they get all those nice things. They have said the first thing you say, do you want us to collect your information um, to make it better, right? And so I always say, so yeah, no, I agree. There's, there's different business models, but as an academic, I think it's important for us to explore other venues and say maybe what makes more sense for us. Again, privacy, security, transparency, these are really important things. And if you're not careful, suddenly population or government will say, forget it. This is the end. Right. Right. The question is, <coughs> is the same is different? This code is that so it's 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 a tough question, right? Because how you deal with the information depends upon the information source. Right. Again, if I basically my body temperature doesn't change very rapidly. And, and so I can afford to be extremely slow. I might not even sense it, uh, sample it. I might do an analog processing on it or something like that. Oh, wow. It really depends upon the source you look at. You have to understand the source. Now, the beauty of, let's say, human body is most of the signals are extremely slow. It's only a few, right? Obviously, vision is fast, but it's still not that fast. Hearing is actually the fastest because you need to discriminate between very small time differentiation if you want to hear it's coming from there you do beamforming and there the speed matters a lot that's why if you look at the nerves that come from your ear they're really thick and uh, they're really thick wires coming down because they want to be fast the eye is smaller nose is very tiny little wires because they have plenty of time smell doesn't go very quickly so it depends from source to source and you optimize for each of those. And sometimes you need, you know, one hertz per uh, sampling rate. Sometimes you need maybe about 100 kilohertz or something like that. And then ultimately you fuse some of those things together as well, right? So there's another single source, you fuse information together. And that requires always some understanding of the signals as well. So really important, you have to understand what you're basically dealing with. You have to understand the source of your information. Okay, well, I think that uh, we thank Jan and in the interest of lunch, uh, we'll uh, proceed. Uh, <laughs> Thank you.